The ocean. A harsh and unpredictable mistress. Mysterious and deadly. But for some, it is a way of life. The only life they know. Year after year, these hardy souls brave the seas in a tiny boat to bring back one of the ocean's most sought-after treasures, the bluefin tuna, that course through Australia's treacherous southern ocean. But high winds and crushing waves are not the only dangers they face. You know the sharks are always going to be there. They're always there. You just got to keep your mind on the job and get it done. This is the story of a new breed of cowboy and a new kind of roundup. One successful expedition can bring in a haul worth $11 million on the open market. But they'll have to cheat death a hundred times to bring home the herd. What makes a man like Nick Pluker do what he does? Maybe it's the challenge of doing a job few can do well. Maybe it's the heady rush of living on the edge. Or maybe he's just got a little of the cowboy in him. Whatever the reason, it's not hard for Nick to identify with these Rodeo men and with the real-life cowboys of the old American West. Like them, he has to wrangle wild animals and make sure he doesn't get killed in the process. He has at least two good reasons to make it home in one piece. Nick's been a fisherman his whole life, like his father before him. He's one of the world's best tuna divers. For the last 12 years, his job has been to round up schools of tuna 250 miles, 400 kilometers out at sea, and lead them back on an arduous tuna drive home to their tuna farms in Port Lincoln, Australia. Nick works for a man who is credited with revolutionizing marine farming and saving South Australia's dying tuna industry a Croatian immigrant named Dinko Lukin. For 40 years, Dinko hunted tuna in the traditional way throughout the Pacific and Indian Oceans with fishing pole and net. But by the late 80s, too many fish had been pulled from the oceans, tuna stocks plummeted, and when fish quality began to drop, the market crashed. But Dinko Lukin wasn't the sort to give up without a fight. He had an idea his buyers in the sushi industry demanded fresh fish in perfect condition. So why not haul the young tuna back alive in underwater holding pens and grow them to full size at a tuna farm? This way, the fish aren't bruised from being heaved onto the boat decks. Better yet, they're only 36 hours from the Japanese fish markets. Tuna farming has changed the industry forever and made Dinko Lukin a multi-millionaire. And Nick has been with Dinko from the beginning. Nick is Dinko's head diver and he's the one who gets down and dirty with the fish. Dinko is tuna farming's visionary. Nick helped develop many of the techniques that made the vision a reality. You can't do this kind of work from a safe distance. You just have to jump into the pen and wrestle each fish into submission, one by one. Or sometimes, two by two. Catch a fish by hand is, is it's a lot more, a lot more of a buzz than, than actually hooking them. 
With a fish, when you catch it, it's a thrill until you either land it or it gets away. But uh, with the farming, that thrill of catching them lasts hours at times. February has come to Port Lincoln, and that means it's time for Nick to leave on the annual tuna roundup. Saying goodbye to his family for two months has always been hard, but it has gotten harder recently. Nick has decided this expedition will be his last. It is a good day to set off. The bright sun and blue skies are auspicious signs. But Dinko and Nick are experienced enough to know the good weather won't last, not on the notorious Southern Ocean. If there's any consolation for Nick's wife, it's knowing this is his final trip out. This is the beginning of an arduous adventure few have witnessed, let alone been a part of. Never before has a camera crew been allowed to film the tuna hunt. The mothership, the 170-foot, 53-metre D3, sails from Port Lincoln into what is perhaps the most dangerous ocean in the world. Australia's south coast is a veritable graveyard for ships. Trailing behind the D3 are two huge pens that will hold the more than 15,000 fish they plan to capture and bring home safe and sound. Nick has a strong supporting cast of divers on this trip. They're young, but they've had a good teacher. Steve Cowley, 23 years old, a former abalone diver. This is Steve's third roundup. For Brenton Matern, 27, this is tuna drive number four. He's also the team's medic. There are many things that could go wrong on an expedition like this. 20-year-old Aaron Newton, the youngest of the team. This is only his second tuna hunt. These shotgun shells need to be waterproofed. The waters the divers will be swimming in are home to some of the deadliest and most aggressive predators in the world. And they have a taste for tuna fish. The shells can only be loaded one at a time into a primitive underwater gun called a powerhead. It can take precious minutes to reload, and it's their only weapon. Nick and Steve work in silence. They know what's coming. Already the competition knows they're there. It's been a week since the tuna cowboys set out for the fishing grounds. Chief tuna diver Nick Pluka keeps constant watch on the horizon, alert to the first signs of an approaching squall. Severe gales batter the Southern Ocean frequently. Winds reaching 80 kilometers or 50 miles an hour are common. Nick has spotted a storm front heading their way. Dinko is worried, but they're almost at the fishing grounds. They've got to stay the course. From December to May, a river of southern bluefin extends from Africa to New Zealand as the fish migrate in search of food. Dingo's destination is a stretch of ocean on the migration trail where he knows they can find schools of the juvenile tuna they're looking for. The oldest bluefin will get up to six feet long and weigh 500 pounds. That's more than 180 kilograms. But Dinko and company aren't interested in the big guys. They're after mid-sized juveniles that they can tow back to shore in holding pens. 
By catching only juveniles, they leave the breeding stock intact, which makes the fishery more sustainable. First, they'll need to assemble the holding pens for the tuna. But the weather report is ominous. The storm front is no more than a day away. Unless they move now, Nick and the divers could be assembling the pens in the teeth of a gale. Do you have another clip there? Did you get it to another clip? Racing against the clock, the cowboys swing into action. To form the pens, they have to attach the netting to the floating rings they've been towing for the last two weeks. First, they drop a giant net into the ocean. One tangle here could scuttle the whole expedition. The nets are huge, 30 yards or 27 meters long, and 50 yards, 45 meters across. The divers have to secure the nets to the floating rings with stainless steel clips, each capable of supporting two tons, the weight of a Rolls Royce. Then they anchor the nets to a central drum, and voila. But the last stage is the most dangerous. To weight the pen, the divers will need an armed escort. Because they have to do this job outside the pen, in open ocean. These are some of the most shark-infested waters in the world. Hunting grounds for bronze whalers, blue sharks, makos, and the infamous Great White. Each one is a known man-killer. Nick and the other divers are as vulnerable as they can be. They've been down more than 50 minutes at a depth of 20 meters, 65 feet. If a shark attacked now, they wouldn't be able to surface quickly to escape. It would be asking for a bad case of decompression sickness. The bends. But this time, the divers have been able to work shark-free, and the first pen is completed without a hitch. Now the D3 can make a beeline to catch up with the other boats in Dinko's fleet, which have gone ahead in search of their quarry. And the call goes out to another member of the team. Dinko's tuna hunters are skilled at spotting the fish from the ocean surface, but nothing can take the place of a bird's eye view. Colin Spratt is a pilot and, like Nick, he's worked with Dinko from the very beginning. He's had his spotter plane on standby, waiting for Dinko's call. Colin's plane is an old Cessna 337. They have an overhead wing with engines mounted fore and aft of the cockpit, so they're perfect for tuna spotting. From the air, Colin can easily make out schools of tuna near the surface. And it's not long before he finds his quarry. I'm on a high ball. Roger, roger. That's Michael, you ready to roll? Yeah, roger, Colin, I can see you circling over there. Can you got an idea of the size of the patch? Uh, any idea of the size of the fish there uh, as well? Oh, I'd say it's a good 20 ton and the size looks good. Be 20 plus. Roger. Guided by their eye in the sky, the chum boat quickly homes in on the fish. Yeah, they're from about uh, one boat length to three boat lengths towards Cetas. Jump the starboard! Like modern day Pied Pipers, the crew begins dropping a trail of fish bait called chum to keep the tuna feeding on the surface. Now, Roger Zoran, we've um, got roughly 30 tonne of fish here. Uh, Michael Van Doren, skipper of the chum boat, um, needs to keep in close contact with Zoran, captain of the Sea Taz, the catch boat. Yay! Back here, come on! Zoran starts the catch boat circling the chum boat. <laughs> this is one of the most crucial maneuvers of the roundup. It demands great skill and intense focus. 
Zorn must drop his net in a circle that encloses both the chum boat and the feeding tuna. No easy feat. Tuna are so wary that often just the noise of the boats will be enough to send them fleeing into the depths. The next few minutes will make or break the catch. Timing is critical too. The catch boat must arrive at the beginning of the net just as the last part peels off the stern. Speed is now of the essence. The pressure is on. The purse net is like a giant snare. It hangs like a gargantuan jellyfish some 350 feet below the surface with a cable threaded around the bottom more than 100 meters down. When the catch boat starts winching in the cable, it will close the net like pulling the drawstrings of a purse. The tuna are in the net, but the team has just minutes to shut the door or the fish may escape out the bottom. The purse is closed. They have the tuna. With the fish now trapped, the chum boat's work is done, and it's time for it to steam out of the purse. Before they can transfer the captured school from the purse net into the holding pen, they must draw in the net cables to enclose the tuna in a tighter space. The time for Nick and his team to swing into action is drawing near. The lumbering D3 is big and very stable, but it's about as maneuverable as a hay wagon in snow. Dinko Lucan may be the only man in the business capable, or crazy enough, to try using a boat like this to steer the floating pens in heaving southern swells. Now the tuna cowboys have to really earn their wages. Because the only way to be sure how many fish they've got is to join the seething mass. Nick will have to dive into the net. It may sound straightforward enough, but the force produced by the thousands of circling fish is creating a whirlpool. It's enough to suck a diver down and pin him to the bottom of the net 100 feet, 30 meters below. And the looming sea storm is almost on top of them. They don't have much time. Deep into open ocean, off the Australian coast, Nick Pluka is facing a very risky task. There are hundreds of tuna circling in the purse net. To gauge the size of the catch, he has to swim into the swirling mass of fish. But he must avoid the whirlpool in the center at all costs. Sucked down 30 meters, almost 100 feet, he wouldn't have enough air in his lungs to make it back. There is a vortex effect. If you go down more than six or eight meters, if you get down 10 meters, uh, the effect is, is quite great. This time, Nick gets back alive and with startling news. Nick guesses they've caught about 1,500 fish, about 40 tons, almost twice the number they thought they'd netted. Nick's estimates are usually right on the money and they're vital, since the tuna hunter's catch is limited by a strict quota system. Now it's time for the other three divers to take to the water ignoring the pitching ocean as they create a gate from the catch net to the holding pen. They need to get the job done before the storm hits. The success of the entire venture now depends on persuading the tuna to move out of the purse and into the pen. Like fish whisperers, the cowboys gently herd the wild tuna into their floating corral. And the operative word is gently. If the fish get spooked, 
they may scatter in panic. Hundreds could be injured or even killed against the net. So far, so good. And suddenly, a tuna tide begins to pour through the gate as 1,500 fish play follow the leader. Their instinct to school means once the drive has begun, the cowboy's job is just to guide the stragglers to the gate. Finally, the last tuna is safely through. It's the news everyone wanted to hear. Only two weeks out from port, they've made the first successful transfer of the trip. But the job isn't over. The cowboys have to close the pen gates and disconnect the catch nets. This is just the first roundup of the day. And with the fish in tow, everything will now take longer. The tuna can only be towed at less than one knot. Any faster, and they'd have to work hard to keep up or be crushed against the back of the pen. On a good day, the team can complete two roundups of this size. But this is not a good day. With their speed reduced and the storm almost upon them, life's about to get very rough. A raging storm hits. Dinko is forced to transfer the tow rope and the pens to the D3's bow, where they can act as an anchor holding the ship's nose into the towering waves. have to keep underway to avoid being hit side on by waves that could easily swamp them. Southern Ocean storms like this have sunk far larger boats than the D3, and Dinko's fragile pens are in danger of being torn apart. Maelstrom, Nick and the divers must go to work to shore up the tuna pens. If they collapse, the team will say goodbye to one and a half million dollars worth of tuna. Again, the waves pummel Nick as he struggles to tighten the hundreds of bolts holding the structure together. The ring shudders with each crashing swell. There's no rest. There's monsters attacking you from everywhere. It's all on. While the storm rages on above, there is more trouble below the surface. The pen wall has been shredded, not by the tempest, but by hungry carnivores attracted by the captured tuna. The nets have to be mended, and quickly. But as Steve Cowley begins repairs, he quickly realizes he may be too late. The sharks are already inside the pen. Hundreds of miles from their home port, the tuna cowboys have faced seven days of screaming winds and mountainous seas. For a couple of days it's all right, and after a week it's tiring. You've got to be mentally prepared for it, because everything's moving in a different direction. You, you, you've got to plan your, your approach and your escape route. You've got to have everything going in your head. You've got to trust your own abilities and um, the guys around you. 
and know your job really well. The dinghy is uh, not a nice place to be because it, it's going up waves and then down really far, so you're getting jerked off your feet all the time. Um, but you do sort of get used to it after a while, wedge yourself in and do your job. As bad as things are on the dinghy, the more serious danger at the moment is circling below. A dozen large bronze whaler sharks have been drawn to the easy pickings in the tuna pen. Especially in groups, the bronze whaler is extremely dangerous and a known man-eater. They watch you and they can see that you're seeing them. They come in to have a look and if you don't actually give an indication that you know they're there, then they get more curious. But for now, the cowboys have to ignore the circling predators. It's more important to repair the pens before the captured tuna can escape. At the same time, Alan Newton is braving the surging seas to replace steel clips that have been stretched to breaking point by the force of the storm. Each clip that fails will double the load on the next one. Losing four or five in a row sets up a chain reaction that could tear the entire net free from the floating rings. Twice a day, day after day, the cowboys battle the seas out to the two pens and then, battered and bruised, fight their way back to the D3. They've been at it for a week now, and at sea for two and a half weeks. Aboard the mothership, it's a weary bunch of cowboys who snatch a little time to rest and trade stories. Finally, the tuna hunters get some news to lighten their weary spirits. The storm is moving off. After nearly three weeks on the deep sea, the weather has allowed them only one catch. But now they can get back to the main event. And the tempest has brought a blessing in its wake. Now the tuna will surface in large numbers to warm themselves. Dinko calls in his eye in the sky. The spotter plane has located a solid 20-ton patch, 18 metric tons. Time for the hunters to see if they can get some new friends for the 1500 tuna in the pen. It's their lucky day. There's a second school of tuna nearby. Roger, roger. I'm just heading uh, towards another one now. And, uh... It requires great skill to position the bait to lure the first school of tuna half a mile, almost a full kilometre, across the glassy ocean and merge it with the second. This time, they pull it off. Roger, Zora and the fish are following well. Um, come in and shoot whenever you're ready. Roger, Zora. And this is just the beginning. After a week of punishing gales, the cowboys strike three dream days in a row. Uh, you've got the net around them. They're still in there, they're still swimming towards the D3 cage. Is he now setting the net? A weather window this long is rare, and the tuna wranglers make the most of it. 
Non-stop from dawn to dusk, the roundup goes on. Until they strike one school that tops them all. A haul of over 3,000 fish, more than 60 tons, 54 metric tons, the equivalent of an adult sperm whale. And when they move the catch into the pen, it takes nearly six minutes for the entire school to swim through the gate, more than twice as long as it usually takes. When it's over, the exhausted divers close the gate for the last time. They've now captured some 15,000 fish after three and a half weeks at sea. The roundup is over. The catch boats will now head for home. And the crew on D3 will be left to complete the most daunting and difficult part of the journey alone. The hunt for the fish may be over, but now an agonizingly slow drive across the southern ocean is about to begin. Nick's thoughts are of the adventure past and of the most dangerous part of the journey ahead. The sharks are still having things their own way in the pens. In the morning, they have to be evicted, and the only way to do it is to jump in and throw them out. The tuna cowboys have more than 15,000 fish in two fragile corrals as they steam slowly homeward. Towing at less than one knot to avoid stressing the fish means the journey home will take more than three weeks. And the team's chief task now is to protect their hard-won bounty from the sharks. It's time to go in and kick out the predators. The long dives require the divers to use surface-fed air. They carry only a small safety supply in case a shark bites through their air hose. The massed tuna in the pens are like a shark magnet. And now, the wolf pack they expected is gathered behind the herd. Bronze whalers, blue sharks, and makos. Hundreds of them. It's more than just holes now. To get at their prey, the hungry sharks have shredded the net wall. Any hole left unmended could give their hard-won tuna an escape hatch. So before they remove the intruders, the nets will have to be repaired. Sharks or no sharks. The cowboys are hampered by the constant current created by the tow. Fighting it makes every move more difficult. And as they mend the net, the divers must keep their eyes open. They are circled by scores of sharks. They can no longer be ignored. While Steve tends to the net, the other cowboys become shark wranglers. They will use herding skills no hero of the American frontier ever had to call on. And they will try to get rid of the sharks without harming them, if possible. They attempt to separate them from the tuna schools. Sharks like these aren't used to being challenged. They flee into the net wall. If the cowboys are lucky, they'll become tangled in the mesh. 
With big aggressive sharks like makos and bronze whalers, the divers would rather have them immobilized before they wrangle them out of the pen. If a shark can't move, it will weaken and eventually die. But herding the invaders into the wall is only the first stage of the job. The most dangerous part is still to come. Someone has to finish the job and actually push the sharks out of the corral. It's Aaron's turn up. The task will take too long to rely on a snorkel. And scuba gear is too cumbersome so Aaron will rely on air fed from above and hope the line isn't severed by a shark's razor-sharp teeth. The diver's herding skills have worked. Some of the sharks have become entangled in the mesh in their panic to get away from the wranglers. They are trapped, but far from harmless. Every time Aaron comes within striking distance, he is at risk of serious injury. He carefully plans his every move. With one bite and twist, a large shark could easily take off his arm. But Nick has taught him well. I've got a great respect for him. I don't uh, underestimate what they can do in an instant. They don't like being touched much at all, the ponds either. As Aaron moves into the shark's blind spot, he's also having to work against the relentless current, which threatens to push him into reach of the shark's teeth. sharks are formidable opponents. Blue sharks are known to have killed hundreds of sailors during World War II, and bronze whalers are noted for their unprovoked attacks on humans. But this is truly one of the most dangerous sharks the divers are likely to encounter. It is the fastest shark alive. A mako shark. A big one. Temporarily snagged but very much alive. Steve has no choice but to go head to head with it, with nothing more than a small pocket knife. The mako has run foul of the floor of the pen. Unless the wrangler cuts it free, it will die of oxygen deprivation. But Steve's approach will have to be very cautious. Makos of this size are extremely dangerous. If a diver had tried to wrangle this nine foot or almost three meter mako while it was free in the pen, it would have attacked without hesitation. Steve is hoping to ease the shark outside the pen before freeing the business end. It's easier to repair a net than replace an arm. The makos, they go a bit silly. They get in there and they freak out. And they just start swimming around and around and snapping at everything. And before you know it, they're caught. They tend to play possum. Um, when they when they're caught in the net, if they're not wrapped up, they'll just lie there and the only way you know they're alive is you see their eye moving, following you around. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, good buzz letting a big shark like that go. Though the Mako is exhausted from lack of oxygen, 
it soon rights itself and swims off. Steve isn't too sad to see it go. Now, he can repair the net. But as fast as the cowboys can throw out sharks and mend the pens, there are always more sharks arriving. Now it's the turn of the blue sharks, some of which are more than 10 feet or three meters long, and they look hungry. As the seagoing cowboys inch their way home, the struggle to finish the drive with their tuna unharmed seems endless. After a month and a half on the open seas, the routine is starting to wear them down. Slipping into damp, cold wetsuits, aching bones, sore muscles, and the bone-jarring ride back to the corrals, trailing nearly half a mile, almost a kilometre, behind the boat. And today, it seems like sharks are actually coming out to meet them. But the joking is short-lived. Another, even larger blue shark has already ripped its way through the net wall and is inside the pen. In the narrow confines of the corral, any shark this size is a threat. But with this one, the wranglers will have to be far more hands-on. Blue sharks rarely become entangled. They don't have the mako's outward-facing teeth to get caught in the netting, and they move more sluggishly. So the divers will have to catch this blue to remove it. It's sometimes possible to lift a shark over the top of the pen, but not this one. It's just too big. Instead, Nick moves quickly to drop the side of the net. But wrangling any shark, even a slow-moving blue, is a risky business. Brent and Steve try to grab hold of the shark's fins to guide it where they want it to go. But it's not always easy to keep your grip. The divers are persistent, but Nick thinks they're taking too long. If you can get two guys to work together and they can both grab one side or the other, a petrol fin and a dorsal fin, um, they can basically steer them where you, where you want to go. Just that you've got you to gotta get in there, you've got to work as a team and you've got to not stir the shark up. Finally, the cowboys manhandle the shark out of the pen into the open ocean. After seven weeks at sea, the final turn for home, and the first land appears on the horizon. One challenge remains. The D3 has to navigate a narrow strait crossed by a powerful current. Just a month ago, another tow vessel lost its entire take of more than 130 tons of fish in this treacherous channel. Riding out the shifting currents in a slow-moving ship will require all of Dinko Lucan's experience. It will be a round-the-clock battle juggling their position and keeping their precious cargo moving steadily forward. It will be two days before Dinko sleeps again. At last they're through and are slowly edging past Cape Catastrophe on their final approach to Port Lincoln. Almost eight weeks after leaving port, the tuna hunters and their precious cargo are safely home again. The fish are now welcomed into their new home at the tuna farm. In five months, they will have doubled in weight and will sell for more than 11 million US dollars in the markets of Tokyo.
The growing popularity of sushi and sashimi around the world means there should be a strong demand for fresh bluefin tuna for a long time to come. And Nick Pluka will remain a part of Dinko's thriving operation, even if he has made his last tuna drive. Two months a year for the past 10 years, Nick's world has been a narrow floating platform from which he's thrown himself into the face of the most extreme ocean conditions to round up the tuna herd and bring it back to the farm safe and sound. He has helped pioneer a method of tuna ranching that is now copied around the world. But it's time to call it a day. I'm definitely gonna, gonna stay home. It's, uh, be with our family, it's, it's worth a lot more to me than, than, uh, than going out there. It is a hard decision. But I wanna spend time with my daughters, watching them grow up. Now there'll be time for embracing a different kind of life. Are you going, Rach? <laughs> no. Oh. Good to see you. Good to see you too, <laughs> But while Nick is hanging up his spurs, Dinko Lucan is definitely not. He's 68 years old and a multi-millionaire. And you can bet the father of tuna farming will be back next season to take on the worst the Southern Ocean can throw at him. It's in his blood. And as long as the bluefin run through the cold southern waters and there are, and are adventurous spirits to take on the challenge, the tuna roundup will continue, no matter what dangers lie below.